Day 394 of the Ukrainian War Map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian War. Jelzy here, and today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine, and we'll start off with those Russian losses, and currently Russia is sitting on 169,000 170 military personnel losses there, which for today represents a, a massive addition of 1,020 Russian losses just in the past 24 hours alone, with no real signs, no real great signs as yet of slowing down. Then in terms of hardware, so four tank losses, 23 APVs, eight artillery, and three Russian air defense systems. And those AD systems do not grow on trees, so always a difficult loss to be had. Then we'll move back across to the map, start out today in Russia, where just north of Kazakhstan, in the Russian town or city of Aramil, a building of the research and production complex is on fire. And this plant actively worked in the defense sector of the Russian Federation, and no word on how or why this happened, although local Russian authorities instead claimed the location to be a paints and varnish workshop. But whether it was this or that, we are seeing an increased incident rate of Russian military production sites becoming prone to a fiery demise now. Then we'll move back into Ukraine, we'll start out in the Donbass, and let's see, so Krimina. So we have some confirmations that Ukrainian troops had indeed pushed Russian troops north of Dubrova. So we'll zoom in this location here to a factor of about 500 to 1,000 meters back. Then also local skirmishing in the forest south of Krimina continues to be ongoing. Then moving down to Bakhmut, where it continues its standstill invasion, so far as a Russian invasion is concerned. And Ukrainian forces have, at least for now, taken the momentum away from assaults around Bakhmut. And Russian Wagner forces boss Prigozhin seems to have really fallen out of favor with Putin this time, as it looks like Russia is potentially looking to send him and his group back to where they came from, which is Africa, a location that his Wagner PMC forces seem pretty accustomed to. Now, I would postulate that sending Prigozhin back to Africa is probably more of a threat, although Prigozhin himself has since changed his inflammatory rhetoric towards the Kremlin to just be a little bit nicer as he went ahead recently and created a short video of him pointing on a larger map of Ukraine, warning about an impending Ukrainian counteroffensive in the hopes that he doesn't uh, get exiled to, to Africa. Then also in the Bakhmut region, we have some footage of Ukrainians identifying a Russian ATGM position, so that's an anti-tank guided missile position, which shortly thereafter becomes destroyed with uh, a Ukrainian Stugna P which was a perfect hit as well. So just to clarify, that's an ATGM taking out another ATGM, and you don't see that every day. Oh, and I have to add just here that uh, pro-Russian telegram channels are always good for a laugh, especially when it comes to analyzing the front. Like this message that says, quote, the armed forces of Ukraine are retreating, but trying to counterattack. But when it comes to Russia, up is down, left is right, and retreating means going forward. Then we'll scoot down the map a bit, uh, have a look at, uh, say, Avdivka. So no changes in the last day here for the second Bakhmut, as they like to call it, although we have some footage here of an abandoned Russian T-72 tank in the vicinity of the location, located then taken out by a loitering drone munition, as flown directly into the gunner hatch. Then, somewhere in the east, in the Donbass, a Russian Zupark II counter-battery fire control radar system was constantly changing positions, but Ukrainian artillerists eventually got this expensive target. 
And so counter battery radar systems are designed to locate artillery positions from the other side, then relay that information for firing back. But the Russian army generally don't use many of these systems because they simply lack the communication platforms to pass on this data to say Russian artillerists who are using old and worn out imprecise artillery barrels anyway. I mean, there's so many points of disconnect for the Russian army to be using one of these devices as it's just not part of their traditional military doctrine. Which is why we've only ever seen a handful of these uh, Russian platforms throughout the entire war. Meanwhile, Ukraine has integrated these puppies quite well as part of their military doctrine, having truckloads of these platforms such as the NATO-developed Cobra counter-battery radar system. Also in the east, an abandoned Russian BMP-2 infantry fighting vehicle was destroyed by a thermobaric grenade dropped into its open hatch. And you see, this would be consistent with the Geneva Conventions regarding legal use of uh, thermo thermobaric munition, small, isolated, and controlled. Which is not like, for instance, uh, the, the Russian use cases. And there's plenty of footage now of uh, the, the Russian forces firing these on a wider scale at residential locations such as villages. And they've done so generally after having a bad week and taking some bad losses, almost like a toddler acting like a bad loser. Then we'll move right across on the map today to Kherson, where earlier there were reports of the Russian forces withdrawing from Novokovka, which turned out to be false reports later on, but I've actually seen uh, this type of report about seven or eight times before, I'm sure, in this war. So it's easy for, for me to take uh, this type of information with a grain of salt. But in reality, the way Russians will leave this town or any frontline location below the Dnipro here will be quite different. Instead, it will happen by Ukrainian forces taking out bases, roads, logistical hubs, supply dumps, and so forth, just constantly after they've ramped up drone and artillery and missile production, thus cutting off Russian forces here and starving them into retreat, which will be somewhat similar to the 6,000 square kilometers or so of liberated territory by the Ukrainian forces just north of the river here. But I think all of this will happen likely and later in combination and coordination with a Ukrainian counteroffensive right next door at the Zaporizhia Oblast as well. And I'm nearly certain of this, but uh, in the fog of war, anything can happen. And there's multiple other potential outcomes that exist as well. But uh, the addition of the Ukrainian forces counteroffensive in Zaporizhia, squeezing out the Russian forces, effectively assisting to cut off the Russian forces uh, southeasterly location below the Dnipro, can indeed make it quite suffocating for them. Then moving down to uh, Groshevka of Crimea, and that is hiding right over here. Here we go. So here we have a pro-Ukrainian citizen who took it upon themselves to fly the Ukrainian flag on the mobile tower. Ballsy move right there, but I certainly admire the courage to do so. Then moving across to some news for today. So there's more and more hardware updates every single day now. Things are really starting to flow through and I'll have to keep this one brief today. But starting off, Finland will deliver an additional three Leopard 2R heavy minesweepers to Ukraine, making for a total of six. And what a beast these things are. And if only they had some sort of offensive capability, <laughs> that would uh, then haunt Russian soldiers in their dreams. Then for some other hardware news, Slovakia delivered four of the 13 promised MiG-29 jets to Ukraine. Now think of these ones roughly, roughly equivalent to the US F-16 and the French Dassault Rafale. Uh, although it's important to note that each aircraft has its own unique features and capabilities, so don't judge me too harshly on those somewhat loose comparisons. But one thing is for absolute certain. 
which is that these MiGs uh, have been subject to much better maintenance and upkeep as opposed to any Russian MiG currently fielded. Also for hardware news, at least 30 PT-91s have been pledged by Poland. Think of these ones as an upgraded T-72M uh, Russian, so a Soviet tank really, first developed and deployed these Polish ones in the, the mid-1990s. So 30 of what could be considered to be some significantly upgraded T-72s is always a win. And I'll stop there for today on the hardware updates, but it really does appear that Ukraine will crack the top 10 globally for military strength sooner or later. Not even kidding. As for example, well, as for example of right now, uh, they're already ranked at 15th. Then moving on to some other news about the uh, Chinese colony of Russia. So Russian bank uh, employees are forced to urgently learn some Chinese. And this is all due to them being cut off by the Western financial system. And I've got to say, Russia is going backwards in that it's increasingly isolating itself and is now devastatingly heavily relying on other countries like China, which is actually tantamount to being a Russian national security concern. That is, to have these heavy reliances on, on other nations. And sure, you might say, but Jazzy, everyone is reliant on Chinese manufacturing. Uh, but most modern democracies, and companies for that matter, have in fact started committing to diversifying their supply chains and manufacturing portfolios to e extend beyond places uh, well, like China. In places such as Vietnam, India, Mexico, Bangladesh, and, and huge swathes of uh, Southeast Asia as well. Even many Eastern European countries these days, such as the Czech Republic and Poland. And it's all in the name of limiting reliance on China due to the increasingly uncertain political landscape involving that country, shall we say. Then some funnies to round it all off for today, guys. So for the first funny, and okay, I, I have a bit of a weird sense of humor, but here we have some grainy drone footage of a group of Russian soldiers running across a field from their prefab concrete bunker to a nearby trench line while taking indirect airburst fire. And it might seem counterintuitive to do this, but prefab bunkers without sufficient camouflage is just a bad idea. Let alone the fact that this one is just sticking out like a sore thumb in the open field. So who is making these... Russian military tactical calls. And I should leave it at that, but I just can't help but notice the straight line trenches design uh, that they're running to, as opposed to a zigzag design because of its uh, the straight line's ineffectiveness and vulnerabilities associated with blast waves, shrapnel, and a general lack of protection. And so I'm pretty sure that all of the experienced Russian field officers and NCOs that normally design the front lines have largely all since been liquidated in 2022. So in the words of the commander-in-chief of the Ukrainian armed forces, we finished up with the Russian professional army, now it's time to defeat the unprofessional. Which is an extremely t-shirt worthy quote. Then in a final funny to round it off with, so... It's been reported that Steven Seagal has been recruited to train Russian soldiers in martial arts. <sighs> Gee, I, I used to actually be fond of this guy back in, say, 1993 when I hired the blockbuster VHS tape for the film Under Siege. And I would normally make a snide comment to the effect of saying something like, and for doing this, Steven Seagal's reputation is under siege. But let's be honest, we've long since passed that point. Since about the mid to late 1990s, if I remember correctly. So thanks for watching, guys. Please leave a comment, subscribe. Thanks for all the support. And I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.